the three most important elements of RoboCop were the screenplay, the director, and the robo suit. How was I to convey the robotics of a machine and the humanity of a, a man at the same time? We spent a big chunk of change, I don't remember, might have been a million dollars on uh, that suit. The danger of this character was that someone would say, well, you're not going to see his face, so you can put anybody in there. And I think that that's not true. You needed a real actor and, and, uh, who really took it seriously, and, and Peter really did. Peter you know, took it seriously from a physical standpoint. He studied mime, and he did this, and he developed this whole thing. And, and he, in, in retrospect, you, you can't imagine the movie without Peter. It was anyhow difficult to, 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 to find the actor because we needed somebody, as, as has been pointed out several times, I mean, it, it, somebody was a really good jawline, isn't it? <laughs> because this is this what you see only this, isn't it? Weller was probably the best person we could get. He was a marathon runner, he was very skinny, and so when you put him in the suit, he looks like a normally proportioned person, but if you put a normally, uh, an actor with a normal physique inside that suit, he looks too big. He really captures the feeling of the robot, physically, uh, you know, vocally, everything. And you really feel like he's solid as a rock. And yet, you know, he had to really work at, work very hard at that to make you have that feeling. Orion and Mike Metavoy, my friend and a great supporter through the years, said, why don't you just find a mime teacher? I was living in New York at the time, still do. And so I interviewed five or six uh, teachers of mime, and I talked to this really gifted gentleman named Moni Yakin, who's head of the movement department at Juilliard, and he read the script, and he wanted to incorporate dance and a fluidity in it, and not just this st staccato pantomime, and so I went with him, and we prepped for about seven months. I put on football gear and would walk around Central Park and work with Moni. Rob Boutin, of course, the uh, genius, really, who is responsible for the beautiful uh, uh, look of that suit and uh, the functionality of it, always works in clay, full size. We used to go to Rob's probably once a week, maybe twice a week in the early days of the design phase. Somehow, suddenly we started to look at uh, Japanese comic books and stuff like that, and then we started to change the design. So every time they would change their minds about the overall concept of this character, that meant that Rob Oteen would have to go out and get a whole new six-foot piece of clay and then sculpt a very detailed statue of what the final thing was going to look like, which in itself was very time-consuming. The drawings that Rob submitted initially were almost exactly you know, what, what we ended up doing. I mean, we did, there's small refinements along the way, but you, I would say that, that Rob just took it and just said, here, this is it, and everybody kind of looked at it and went, wow, that's cool. It's a bunch of different pieces, about approximately two dozen, but they're very simple. You just put them on one at a time. Essentially, what you're seeing is pieces hung from the actor. Uh, what there is under this chest plate is a harness and there's a harness that hangs from the shoulders and goes across the back and across the chest. And these pieces here were literally hung on this harness and snapped on in the back. The legs were leggings that you could actually pull on like long socks. And then you had the shoes which had little sneakers inside of them so that you could slip your feet in those and then they would be secure. The uh, hands, which were supposed to be metal, were actually a kind of a foam rubber glove that just slipped on. And then again, these pieces were just kind of snapped on in like uh, half sections. To get something that's as nice and as pretty and, and as effective as this uh, was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. From the moment that they started designing the suit uh, to the day that they actually delivered the final one was an eight-month process. After I had done the casting with Rob Boutin for the suit and for the face, we did not get a chance to try out this suit before we had to shoot with it. They had done a full body cast of Peter Weller. Then molds were pulled from the body cast. And so all the pieces basically were made for Peter's body. So I had been shooting in Dallas for two weeks, the non-robotic part of the film. And then the suit arrived, and Rob and his entire coterie showed up. And at that point, it took eight hours to put Peter Weller into the suit. It took us about 10 hours to put on the suit the first time. And it took, well, 11 hours to, to get him into the suit the first time. Moni Yakin and I had developed this very fluid-like 
this legato, if you will, style of movement, almost like a snake. When the suit came and it was as heavy as it was, and we were already shooting, uh, I could hardly move in it. So you had two problems the very first day. The suit is very late, and the suit doesn't work, at least not for Peter. Putting on the suit for the first time depressed me possibly more than anything except the end of a love affair 20 years ago that I can remember. They had to shave something off here just a little bit. Maybe they would have to break a piece off and then re-glue it over here. It was all just to make it work on Peter Weller. Once he removed the armpits and the knees and part of the heels of the feet and the neck, then I could start to work the outer shell of the suit more freely. But that still didn't give me the fluid-like movement that Moni and I had worked on for seven months. And Peter, quite rightly, became very um, vocal in uh, his insistence that he be given some time to try to figure out how now to work with this suit. Arguments ensued, what are we gonna do? Uh, I had my percentage of stuff to say, believe me in it, uh, as did Rob and Paul. So they actually shut down the production for two days. So after the first day, we were suddenly two days behind. <laughs> and uh, those two days, Peter Weller and Moni and Paul Verhoeven all worked very closely together to come up with a new way of Peter to move. We started to move the suit and Paul started to shoot tests on it. And Moni took me inside and said, look, slow everything down. It's no longer a snake, it's a beast. It's got to be big and the accents have to be huge. The dissection and the definition of the ends of these movements have to be absolutely staccato and not legato. The head has to move like bang. We'd see Peter out there in the parking lot, you know, marching around with this, you know, with his uh, movement coach um, to make it look right, you know, uh, and, and it made a big difference. He needed that time. And, and rightly so, and I think we were pissed off at, at him that he was, uh, let's say, in our opinion, obstructive, but I, I don't see it that way any, anymore at all. That warehouse, I just remember how difficult it was to breathe in there by the end of the day. And, and then as soon as I felt really, really sorry for myself, as I said, this was also in August and it was really hot, then I just look over at Peter Weller, and he'd be in that RoboCop suit, which was like built on a wetsuit, you know, and, and he'd just be sitting there with hoses air hoses stuck down in. He was constantly having to rehydrate himself. And so there was always the danger that, you know, <laughs> these uh, horrific conditions might take out our star. He'd lose eight to 10 pounds a day, you know, just in dehydration. Then he'd have to put it on at night. Whenever I felt bad, I just look at Peter and I didn't feel nearly as bad. <laughs> Peter's gonna hate that I say this, but I don't care. All the cast and crew got memoranda saying on the set, don't refer to Peter as Peter or Mr. Weller. Don't call him by anything other than Murphy or Robo, depending on who he's playing that day. And I'd known Peter for 10 years prior, so I was like, Pfft, are you kidding me? Are you joking? So, uh, so we used to tease him. You know, he'd be sitting there in the suit in between takes, and I'd say, Pete, what's happening, man? What's going on? And he'd ignore me. I'd say, Pete, I'm talking to you. Peter, I'm talking to you. I know no one named Peter. <laughs> he would actually try to say that. I said, oh, come on. And then, by the way, is that the voice you're using, really? Is that how you're going to do it? Okay. In the beginning, he was so mad at actor that he didn't want me to call him Peter, but I had to talk to uh, address him and like Robocop. But I couldn't. I thought it was so silly. <laughs> I just couldn't do it, you know. I said, I'm mad at actor or not. I can't do it. I can't do it. He dropped that after, after a couple of weeks, but it was pretty funny. The suit was ready when it was ready. And Paul became accustomed to that, that he couldn't rush these guys because the second that we'd cut, immediately, like a team of Ferrari mechanics, these guys would go to work on me. They designed this fake car built on a platform and when they finally got the prototype there, they were very surprised to find that Peter Weller in the suit wouldn't fit in the car. Getting into the car, you couldn't get into the car with the legs, you know, it was too much suit to get into a car. This suit, which I first thought was cumbersome and lugubrious, slowed me down and made the beast of this guy, like Moni said, uh, 
come through. So when we were working this, Moni would say, you know, it'd be great. If, and he stayed for two weeks. It'd be great if you, like, move the shoulder and then the head uh, or move the chest and then the head or move the head and then the chest. I felt that the man in the iron mask and other stories that involved uh, kind of political repression of the hero were central to the way we developed the story. The man in the machine has been a classic story in science fiction. And when you consider that he's trapped in there with human memories, human emotions, that becomes a very important identification for the audience. When will he speak? When will he recognize himself? Can I help you? Aim for me. I did an adjustment in the voice. It's softer. If you go back and look at it, it's just a little bit softer. It's not, thank you for your cooperation. It's, can you help me adjust? It's a little more of this. It's coming back to him. The real transformational moment is when I take off that helmet and I say that I feel them, but I can't remember them. The linear thought process is probably gone, but the sense of the thing, the sense of humanity is there. The leg that holsters the gun, uh, of course, was a separate cable-controlled piece, so it was never incorporated into the costume. It was a standalone. It was designed so that guys off camera could actually push and pull with cable controls, and they would pull a cable uh, uh, like this, and it would actually open up a latch and a spring, and pop, it would pop out. And there was the, there was the gun already hidden inside of it. And so then when they wanted to do the opposite of closing it, they would just pull the other cable and poof, it would go back in. Robo also had what was called the terminal strip. That's that very wicked looking spike that comes out of his wrist when he pops his arm out like this. And it's basically to interface him with any kind of computer or any kind of electronic equipment that he can exchange data with. The whole terminal strip uh, apparatus was a completely separate cable controlled arm that was held up by offstage technicians to make it look like Peter Weller was doing it, but he wasn't. When he gets me with the spike in the neck, it was actually somebody else's hand down there. There were Peter and I, and there's, then there was another person down there with the, you know, you know, with the false hand with the spike popping out. You're down there fighting somebody to the death, and then there's another person crawling along beside <clears throat> with a false hand. That whole arm was actually a working replica too, and that was something, again, that was constructed by Rob Bottin specifically before that shot. And again, operated by cable controls off camera, and the hand could move and the fingers could move, and yes, it could shake hands, but it couldn't crush your hand like it shows in the picture. Actually, it had a pretty good grip, uh, surprisingly, uh, but not enough to uh, pulp somebody. The hands were rubber gloves. So every time we threw the car keys, it, they would bounce out of the rubber gloves. And we must have shot this 50 times. And I think that was, that was it for the day. That was it. You know, we, we'd been there 14 hours or something. And finally, we got a shot where Peter anticipated the keys and uh, caught them and turned around, walked out the door. And that was a day's shooting. The heaviest part of the entire suit was the helmet because the helmet was made out of fiberglass and um, basically neoprene, uh, which is a uh, oxygen impregnated rubber that is used in wetsuits for diving. And that's what a lot of the blacks were too. It was like neoprene. It's like a very thin rubber that you can cut and scissor. Walking down those stairs in that discotheque though was only the head and the chest. But still, Robo isn't like looking at his feet, oh, there's stairs down there, I think I have to walk down them. Robo is a computer-driven machine. He knows where the next step is. So I had to walk down these steps with all of that smoke and that music pounding, and Josef Akano following me or leading me with a camera, and not look at the steps. And the steps were only about eight inches in depth. And that was hairy, because if I took a tumble on that, that could have been broken necks and everything else. And I did that three times. Leon Nash was um, in, in the discotheque enjoying himself, as only Leon can. He wasn't expecting uh, this uh, robo character to come into the, the discotheque and pick him up and arrest him. And of course, then he did the most stupid thing in the world. He tried to kick him in the groin. Okay. And that doesn't work uh, for, for RoboCop. I'm not exactly sure what that area is composed of. And I never 
saw it that closely, but it was hard on the, on the, on the foot. Seeing his eyes and not seeing his eyes was a big debate between all of us. So the gunshot, when we see an eye, is a very important step towards stripping away the mask of the character. Rob Bottin and Paul Verhoeven and Ed Newmar had all come up with the concept that there would be such a potential for psychological disruption, even if you would supposedly wipe someone's memories and emotions, they still might have some kind of residual humanity where if they looked at themselves as a complete robot with no relation to their past organic form, they'd completely freak out and have a psychotic breakdown. So the idea was that surgeons had literally skinned off Alex Murphy's face and then placed it on the cyborg. So it's not like they transplanted his head, they just took his face off and laid it on the cyborg and that was to give him his own little sense of identity. Basically there was a shell, a plastic shell that fit on the back of Peter Weller's head that looked like the back of the Robocop head and then there was a separate breakaway piece that was done specifically for the moment when he pulls his helmet off. Underneath they had put a bald cap on Peter so that his hair was gone and then they had extended out these little foam pieces to the edges of his face so it looks like they were literally stapled or layered onto the metal. Stefan Dupuy, this gifted human being who applied that face, that was a six and one half hour sit for me, six and a half hours for one piece of prosthesis. Stefan would take three and a half hours to put it on, he would take a break, I do Zen meditation, so I'd meditate in this chair. But the 27 days or the 21 days that we did that phase, after the break, Stefan would come back and then he would do the makeup. In those days, after six and a half hours, I would shoot for five or six hours because that's all that face would tolerate before the rubber would start to come off. I would be going to work at 2.30 in the morning sometimes while the crew would be coming in from partying because they know they would have a late call because old Weller would be in that chair with Stefan for the next six and a half hours, and there's another hour and a half of that suit. So I'd be working an eight or nine hour day before the film was even burned. There was a gun that we had uh, initially got for RoboCop. It's called an Israeli Desert Eagle, and it's the gun that is in the boardroom that is pulled out of the box that is uh, used to threaten Ed 209, and later Ronnie Cox pulls out to hold the old man hostage. That gun, which is a huge, was a kind of an, a, a new gun at the time and had an interesting look, and is really a big gun. When you put it in Robocop's hand, it looked like a, a, a cap pistol. This is a Beretta 93R, an actual firearm uh, made by the Beretta company in the mid 80s that was modified by the weapons master, uh, the person who was in charge of all the armory on Robocop, and that was a Texan named Randy Moore. It was an unusual gun because it, it, was, it was developed as an anti-terrorist gun back when terrorists weren't what they are now, and it could fire multiple shots. There's a little switch on the side of a real Beretta that allows you to flick it up, and then when you squeeze the trigger, you're not just shooting one shot, you're shooting three at the same time. It was an automatic pistol, and it was big, and so we, we, we sat down one afternoon and we designed some stuff to go on it to make it look even bigger and me meatier. And I remember saying, well, the front of it should look like a sarcophagus because it's death. And you know, one thing led to another and there it was. And he made it and two days later he came up to my hotel room and, and he said, you want to see it? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, well, let's go in the bathroom and we'll fire it off. <laughs> and, you know, we'll close the door. And, and now if you did this now, you'd just, you know, they'd, they'd arrest you, uh, put you under the jail. But uh, you know, so we go in the bathroom, we close the door and, and he fires this thing off and it's as big as, it puts powder everywhere in the room, the mirror is covered with gunpowder, and, uh, and it sets off the smoke alarm on the other side of the wall, and it was astounding. He extended the barrel out here, uh, put these nice flanges on the side, and then also drilled holes on the side so that when the gun fired, you would not only get a tongue of flame from the barrel, but also from each side, so it would look really cool and spectacular and intimidating on film. Well, I grew up in West Texas, and I grew up around guns, and when I was a high school kid, I was a fast draw. I could twirl the nine mil as, as Murphy, but this gun came, and this gun is a very special gun. It was an automatic weapon. It was a fully automatic nine mil weapon designed by Beretta, as I recall. And the feds had to okay the entrance of this gun in the United States, and you know, it was a machine gun. Twirling it was another matter altogether, although it was perfectly balanced. It's like trying to t twirl half of a baseball bat. I got to twirling it, and it worked. And so I just used my own West Texas expertise to sort of uh, 
heighten that. You know, it's an integral part of the old Rovo personality, man. You know, to twirl that gun into a holster like a, like a cowboy. I've done some movies I'm not so proud of. I've done some movies that I'm proud of parts of. And I've done maybe five or six movies that I'm really proud of, and Robocop is definitely one of them. Thank <laughs> you.